Hey everyone, this is Dr. Marcon. Hope everyone had a really good spring break. This is the chapter on the respiratory system, which is part of uh, the next unit. The respiratory system has um, some basic functions. Of course, it supplies the body with oxygen and disposes of carbon dioxide. There are four processes involved in respiration. So first we have pulmonary ventilation. This is when air needs to be moved into and out of the lungs so that the gases and the alveoli are continuously replaced. Then we have external respiration. This is when we have gas exchange, and this gas ex exchange must occur between the blood and the air at the lung alveoli. Oxygen will diffuse into the blood from the alveoli, uh, alveoli again being air sacs at the end of the bronchioles in the lungs. And then carbon dioxide will diffuse into the alveoli to be exhaled out of the body. We breathe in oxygen, oxygen gets diffused into our blood, and then we breathe out carbon dioxide. Another process involved in respiration is the transport of respiratory gases. So oxygen, carbon dioxide must be transported between the lungs and the cells of the body, and this is through the blood and the cardiovascular system. Another process is internal respiration. This is when gas exchange between the systemic capillaries um, occurs. So oxygen will be transported to the tissues where the tissues will use this oxygen for various metabolic processes. And then carbon dioxide, which is a product of metabolism, will be taken away back to the heart and lungs. First, we'll get into the functional anatomy of the respiratory system. We have our important respiratory organs. We have the nose, nasal cavity, and the paranasal sinuses. Next, we have the pharynx, the larynx, and the trachea. Then we have the bronchi and the smaller branches of the bronchi. And of course, we have the lungs and the alveoli. The alveoli, again, being those sacs um, that are filled with air. Um, and they are little pouches at the end of the bronchioles. This picture shows the different structures that are contained within the respiratory system. So this is the major respiratory organs. We have, of course, the nostril, where air enters the uh, nasal cavity. So this area here being the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity, when we talked about bones and bones of the skull, we know that the nasal cavity, there is a right and a left, and we have that wall, that nasal septum, that separates the nasal cavity into right and left nasal cavity. So from the nasal cavity, we then enter uh, part of the pharynx. There are three parts of the pharynx, which we'll learn about. So we enter the first part of the pharynx, here, which is the nasopharynx, then we enter the oropharynx, and then the third part of the pharynx is the laryngopharynx, right before we hit the actual larynx, located here. The larynx also important not only for the transport of air into our lungs, but also for the production of speech. So from the larynx, air will then travel down the trachea. The trachea is a structure that has cartilaginous rings or rings made out of cartilage. If you remember the type of cartilage, we have hyaline cartilage um, that makes up the cartilaginous rings of the trachea. And then we have this structure. It's called the carina. The carina is a structure where the trachea will bifurcate or split into the main bronchi. So we have a right and left main bronchi. So the carina is at the vertebral level, T4, T5. So the carina, again, being that structure where the trachea will bifurcate or split into right and left primary or main bronchus or bronchi. Bronchus being singular, bronchi being the plural form. And then we can see the right and left lungs and the different lobes that make up the right and left lungs. We have three lobes, 
on the right, we have a superior, middle, and inferior lobe, and then just two lobes on the left, a superior and inferior lobe. We have the pleura that surrounds the lungs, and we'll talk about the pleura in just a little bit. And finally, we have a muscle here called the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. And this is the muscle where the lungs will sit and aid in respiration. So more functional anatomy of the respiratory system. The respiratory system is actually divided into two parts. We have the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. And we can see the different structures that make up both the upper and lower respiratory systems. According to your book, the upper respiratory system is made up of the nose, the nasal cavity, the pharynx, and the three different parts of the pharynx, as well as the larynx. Now the larynx is actually kind of controversial. There are some books that say that the larynx is part of the lower respiratory system, but according to your book, and we'll go by your book, the larynx in this case is part of the upper respiratory system. And then we have the organs of the lower respiratory system. We have the trachea, the bronchi, bronchi in this case being plural, so we have uh, right and left uh, bronchi. So if we were to tag it on a structure, it would be right bronchus versus left bronchus if we're just tagging one. But bronchi in this case is plural. Uh, so we have bronchi and the smaller branches of the bronchi. We also have lungs and the alveoli. And these structures make up the lower respiratory system. We have another way of dividing up the respiratory system. Uh, we can divide the respiratory system into zones. The first zone that we're gonna talk about is the conducting zone. These are the respiratory passageways that actually conduct and convey air. Uh, within the conducting zone, air is filtered, it's humidified, and it's also warmed. So we have filtering, hum humidification, warming of incoming air into the passageways. The conducting zone uh, begins with the nose and then will end with the terminal bronchioles. And we'll see pictures of that in just a little bit. The next zone is the respiratory zone. The respiratory zone is a site where gas exchange occurs within the lungs. And these include structures that have alveoli. Um, so the respiratory zone, um, it begins with the respiratory bronchioles and goes all the way down to the terminal clusters of alveoli called alveolar sacs. And these look like uh, clusters of grapes. So now we're going to get into the individual structures and organs that make up the respiratory system. So the first thing that we're going to talk about, the first structure we're going to talk about, of course, is the nose. So the nose provides an airway for respiration. It helps moisten and warm air. It also helps filter inhaled air. We have little hairs within our nose that helps filter out uh, any debris, any pollution, any you know possible pathogens. The nose is also a resonating chamber for speech. If you've ever taken French, you can definitely tell that a lot of the French language is very, very nasal. Uh, the nose also houses olfactory receptors. We talked about different bones, um, especially the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone that has holes, little foramina, where uh, the olfactory nerve can actually go through and then enter the nasal cavity so that it can pick up uh, smells. Now, size variation of the nose, of course, is due to differences in the nasal cartilages that make up the nose. Uh, the skin of the nose is thin and can contain many sebaceous glands. Uh, we all know, you know, this is a site where you can have blackheads, and if you get one of those Biore strips, you can place them on your nose to kind of clean out those pores within the nose. Uh, if you ever picked one up, you can see they're all spiky because it picks up all the dirt that's contained within the pores. I don't know, I'm, I'm the type of person that always ends up looking at the uh, the Biore strip just to see, and it's kind of cool and gross at the same time. 
So here we see a couple of pictures. We see the surface anatomy of the nose. We have the ala of the nose, these little wings right here. Here's a little apex of the nose, a little pointy part. Um, up here would be the root and the bridge of the nose. Um, uh, located just above the root and bridge is the frontal belly of that muscle that kind of helps you um, move your eyebrows. And then we have the nares or nostrils of the nose right here. And then the next picture shows you the different cartilages that make up the nose and the different bones also that are that surround the nose. So the exter external nares are your nostrils, and these are uh, form the entrance to the nasal cavity. So we have right and left nostrils, each providing a passageway to the right and left nasal cavity. We know the nasal cavity is divided by a wall. It's divided by the nasal septum. Again, when you see the word septum, think wall. So the nasal cavity divided by the nasal septum will then be continuous with the nasopharynx, the first part of the pharynx, which is located posteriorly. We also have posterior nasal apertures. These are our cones. So remember we talked about uh, the turbinates, um, also the superior, middle, and inferior concha, those turbinates that kind of helped warm the air as the um, air traveled within the nasal cavity. So within the nasal cavity, there are two types of mucous membranes. We have the olfactory mucosa. The olfactory mucosa are located near the roof of the nasal cavity. And this is where we have our smell or olfactory receptors uh, that are located. Another type of mucosa is the respiratory mucosa. Uh, the respiratory mucosa lines the nasal cavity and the epithelium, just like most of the respiratory system, is made up of the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Again, this is the epithelium that we saw in the beginning of the semester. It looks like there are many layers to this epithelium. In reality, it's actually one layer and just having the, uh, the nuclei of the cells of the epithelium kind of at different layers to give it that stratified appearance, but really it's only one layer. So be familiar with this picture. Uh, this is a picture of the upper respiratory tract. So we have our nostrils located here, again, being that opening towards the nasal cavity. This is a sagittal view of uh, the upper respiratory tract. So we can see located laterally the um, different concha, the nasal concha. So here is the superior nasal concha, the middle nasal concha, and the inferior nasal concha. Um, so if we kind of look behind the nasal septum, these are the structures that we'll see lateral to the nasal cavity. So then posterior to the nasal cavity, we have that first part of the pharynx, and that's the nasopharynx. Within the nasopharynx, we can see this tonsil right here called the pharyngeal tonsil. And then within the nasopharynx, we can also see an opening. So this is actually the opening of the pharyngotympanic tube, also known as the auditory tube, also known as the eustachian tube. These are all three names that we give to the pharyngotympanic tube. One of my favorite structures actually above the opening of the pharyngotympanic tube is this like hoodie-like structure right above the opening. This is also known as the torus tabarius. It's just this little uh, hoodie-like structure just above that opening. You don't need to know it, but it's one of my favorite structures just because I like the name Taurus Tabarius. So from the nasopharynx, you then hit the second part of the pharynx called the oropharynx, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. But here we can definitely see the nostrils, uh, one part of the nasal cavity, um, and then the posterior portion of the nasal cavity is the nasopharynx where you can see a pharyngeal tonsil as well as the opening to the pharyngotympanic tube. Again, the pharyngotympanic tube is also known as the auditory tube uh, or the eustachian tube. <laughs> 
And we'll get back to this picture again when we look at other structures of the respiratory system. So we talked a little bit about the respiratory mucosa. Again, it's made up of that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And then within the epithelium, we can see goblet cells. Goblet cells, of course, being important for producing mucus. Uh, we know sometimes we breathe in some pollution or dirt poly uh, uh, molecules or sometimes uh, some bacteria or, you know, hopefully you're not exposed to, but maybe some viruses like the current coronaviruses. So these goblet cells are important for actually secreting mucus that can trap these particles. So the underlying layer of the lamina propria of the respiratory mucosa is made up of different glands. We have compound tubuloalveolar glands in the lamina propria that contain mucus and serous cells. So the pseudostratified uh, columnar epithelium is ciliated. So the cilia of this epithelium will help move any contaminated mucus posteriorly to the pharynx. Uh, filtered particles and mucus can be swallowed and digested by the digestive juices in the stomach, or sometimes we kind of hack it out and uh, take it out via the mouth. Um, not very polite in public, but if you need to excuse yourself to go to the bathroom, that's okay too, to kind of hack out that mucus that can be found in that upper part of the respiratory system. So sensory nerve endings uh, from cranial, cranial nerve 5, uh, we know that to be the trigeminal nerve, also supply the respiratory mucosa. The trigeminal nerve is important because if we have any irritating, irritating particle, particles such as dust, pollen, um, bacteria, so forth, it actually initiates the sneeze reflex so that when we sneeze, we kind of expel these particles out through our nose. So the trigeminal nerve is responsible for that sneeze reflex. So within the nasal cavity, we have the nasal concha. Uh, the superior and middle nasal concha are part of the ethmoid bone. The superior nasal concha was that bone we couldn't see if we looked at the skull anteriorly. Um, the superior nasal concha is actually located more posteriorly. And again, it's part of the ethmoid bone. The inferior nasal concha uh, is a separate bone from superior and middle. And we know that the nasal concha project medially uh, from the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. So within the nasal cavity, any particulate matter, anything that we inhale from the air, such as dust or uh, any pathogens or pollutants, these are actually deflected to the mucus coated surfaces of the nasal concha. Now during inhalation, the nasal concha are responsible uh, to help filter heat and moisten any incoming air. Uh, during exhalation, moisture and heat are reclaimed. So um, the inhaled air will cool the concha and then during exhalation, these cooled concha will precipitate moisture and extract heat from the humid air flowing over them. This mechanism of reclamation actually minimizes the amount of moisture and heat that is lost from the body through breathing. So this actually helps people to survive in dry and cold climates. So now we have structures called the peri paranasal sinuses, and I believe I did go over paranasal sinuses with you when we went over structures of the skull. Uh, the paranasal sinuses are located within the frontal bone, maxillary bone, sphenoid bone, and ethmoid bone. So the mnemonic that I use to help you remember the uh, paranasal sinuses is the uh, mnemonic FEMS. So F. E, M, well that didn't work, 
F-E-M-S. All right, note to self, buy a pen to draw stuff. FEMS. So F stands for frontal bone, E stands for ethmoid bone, M stands for maxillary, um, and then S is sphenoid. So these are the paranasal sinuses. The paranasal sinuses, these are sinuses that actually open into the nasal cavity. So the perinasal sinuses help lighten the skull because they are um, spaces within the skull that help lighten the, the skull. They help to warm and moisten air and also produce mucus. We all know what happens when mucus uh, goes into the sinuses, becomes infected, and we have an inflammation of the sinuses. So anything that ends in itis. Uh, means inflammation of, so sinusitis is inflammation of the mucus within the paranasal sinuses. And it, it produces those symptoms of congestion, that heavy feeling within the head, especially uh, around the nose and behind, behind the eyes. Uh, this inflammation causes sinusitis. So here we see the different paranasal sinuses. Uh, the frontal sinus, of course, located within the frontal bone. The ethmoid uh, sinuses, also known as the ethmoid air cells within the ethmoid bone, maxillary sinus uh, just uh, on the sides of the nose within the maxillary bone, and then the sphenoid sinus located posteriorly. Uh, most um, often you can see it just posterior to the superior nasal concha, which is the superior part of the nasal cavity. If we actually go back to that picture here, so here is that sphenoid sinus uh, located posteriorly to the superior nasal concha there. So here is that sphenoid sinus. Um, we can also see in this sagittal view the frontal sinus here located within the frontal bone. Next, we're going to talk about the pharynx. The pharynx is a funnel-shaped passageway. The pharynx is a structure that connects the nasal cavity as well as the mouth. Um, the pharynx is divided into three main sections and according to location. So post, we talked about the nasopharynx, which is posterior to the nasal cavity. Uh, the, um, but the, where the nasopharynx end is usually around the area of the uvula, and then between the uvula and the epiglottis, posterior to the oral cavity will be the oral pharynx. And then after the epiglottis uh, down to the larynx, we have the laryngopharynx. And the type of mucosal lining changes along the length of the pharynx. So again, here's that picture, that sagittal view. Uh, we can see the nasopharynx just posterior to the nasal cavity ending at the uvula, this sort of punching bag-like structure that we'll talk about. And then uh, between the uvula and the epiglottis just posterior to the oral cavity, we have the oropharynx here. And then from the epiglottis down, we have the lar lar laryngopharynx. Say that five times fast. The laryngopharynx located near the larynx. So the nasopharynx, we've already talked about, is superior to the point where food enters and serves only as an air passageway. The nas nasopharynx is actually closed off during swallowing. We talked about that structure of the uvula, which is in the back of uh, the oral cavity or back of the throat, that punching bag uh, looking like structure. Um, the uvula will re reflect superiorly, meaning um, it will go up and will close off the nasopharynx to prevent food from entering the nasal cavity when we swallow. However, we all know what happens when we're laughing or giggling while we're drinking and someone says something really funny or watches something really funny on TV. Um, and this sealing action by the uvula will actually fail and fluids can spray out the nose. Um, not so funny when it's hot coffee. So the nasopharynx is continuous with the nasal cavity posteriorly located within the nasopharynx. 
are the pharyngeal tonsils or the adenoids. Uh, these tonsils are located on the posterior wall. Um, this structure destroys any entering pathogens. Uh, within the nasopharynx, you have the opening to the pharyngotympanic tube, which we talked about. Pharyngotympanic tube, also known as the auditory tube, also known as the eustachian tube. All three names are used to describe this tube. And then we have uh, a tubal tonsil that provides some protection from infection. The next part of the pharynx we'll talk about is the oropharynx. Uh, the oropharynx located posterior to the oral cavity. Uh, within the oral cavity, posteriorly, we have the arch-like entranceway called the fossies. Uh, the fossies actually extends from the soft palate, uh, which is that soft part of the roof of your mouth uh, located posteriorly. So the fossies extends from the soft palate to the epiglottis. The epithelium of the oropharynx is a stratified squamous epithelium. And then we have two types of tonsils within the oropharynx. We have the palatine tonsils. The palatine tonsils are located in the lateral walls of the fossies. These are the tonsils that we see when we ask a patient to open their mouth and stick out their tongue and use a tongue depressor. These are the tonsils that most often patients complain about when they have a sore throat or tonsillitis. So these are called the palatine tonsils. Again, located laterally in the lateral walls of the, um, the mouth. And then we have the lingual tonsils. Uh, the lingual tonsils are actually located um, at the base of the tongue and cover the posterior surface of the tongue. So if we look at that picture again, we can see uh, along the lateral walls of the um, oral cavity towards the oropharynx, here is the palatine tonsil, and then at the base of the tongue, here is that lingual tonsil. The next part of the pharynx is the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx is actually a passageway for both food and air. The laryngopharynx starts around the area of the epiglottis. Um, the epithelium for the laryngopharynx is a stratified squamous epithelium. It is continuous with the esophagus and the larynx. It will extend to the inferior boundary of the cricoid cartilage. cartilage. So if, again, if we look at that picture, uh, where the oropharynx ends, the laryngopharynx will begin. And then here uh, within the larynx is the cricoid cartilage right here. So this part uh, where the cricoid cartilage, uh, the inferior border here, this is where the laryngopharynx ends. So from here to here is considered the laryngopharynx. Again, posterior to the larynx. Uh, the laryngopharynx is actually continuous with the esophagus inferiorly. So the next respiratory structure that we're going to talk about is the larynx. The larynx extends from the fourth to sixth cervical vertebrae, from, so from C4 to C6. will attach the hyoid bone superiorly uh, and opens into the laryngopharynx. Inferiorly, the larynx is continuous with the trachea. The larynx has three functions. It has a function with voice production, so it produces um, our voice, provides an open airway. Uh, it also helps root air and food into the proper channels. Uh, the superior opening is closed during swallowing, but open during breathing. So we have a cartilage that helps us with that function, and that's the epiglottis. So the epiglottis will close during swallowing so that uh, food can be directed towards the esophagus, and the epiglottis is open during breathing so that air can be uh, directed down the larynx towards the trachea, towards the lungs. Now the framework of the larynx is an arrangement of nine cartilages.
So these are the nine cartilages of the larynx. First, we have this very large cartilage called the thyroid cartilage. It's called the thyroid cartilage because it's um, proximity to the thyroid gland. The thyroid cartilage is shield shaped. It forms the laryngeal prominence. The laryngeal prominence is also known as the Adam's apple. Now during an exam, make sure you're writing laryngeal prominence, not Adam's apple. But the laryngeal prominence, again, is part of the thyroid cartilage. We then have three pairs of smaller cartilages making up the larynx. We have the arytenoid cartilages, the corniculate cartilages, and the cuneiform cartilages. So again, these are pairs of small cartilages. Then, of course, we have that very important epiglottis. Um, the epiglottis will tip inferiorly during swallowing so that when we swallow food or liquids or saliva, um, anything that we swallow goes towards the uh, esophagus. So within the larynx, we have vocal ligaments that help us with sound production. Uh, the most important vocal ligaments are the vocal folds, also known as the true vocal cords. It is these folds that actually act in sound production. And then lateral to these folds are called the vestibular folds. The vestibular folds are called the false vocal cords because they have no role in sound production. We then have a structure called the rima glottidis. The rima glottidis is the medial opening between the vocal folds um, and then the structure called the glottis is actually a combination of the rima glottidis and the vocal folds together. So these stru structures coming together form the glottis. And we have a picture of that. Let's see if we can find a proper here. So medially, these are the true vocal folds or vocal cords. So between the vocal folds is the rima glottidis and a combination of the rima glottidis along with the vocal folds or true vocal cords form the glottis. Okay, and it's that opening that allows air to pass through and, uh, and produce sound. The epithelium of the larynx is made up of a stratified squamous epithelium in the superior portion of the larynx, and the more inferior portion of the uh, larynx is made up of the pseudostratified ciliate columnar epithelium, typical of the respiratory epithelium. So a surface view of the neck, we can actually see um, or palpate the body of the hyoid bone. Again, that bone being uh, the bone that's not actually connected to any other bone, but is in fact suspended. And then part of the thyroid cartilage we can palpate, which is um, this little bump right here, also known as the laryngeal prominence or the Adam's apple. And then below the laryngeal prominence is part of the cricoid cartilage. And then we can see um, superficially part of that muscle, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, as well as the clavicle and that little jugular notch, um, just superior to the manubrium of the sternum. So here are the structures that we can see of the larynx. Uh, we can see that it is attached to the hyoid bone. Um, here's the hyoid bone superior to the larynx. Um, and then uh, posterior to that, we can see part of the epiglottis that, again, that flap of cartilage that directs uh, air into the trachea towards the lungs or food towards the esophagus when it closes while we're swallowing. So here is that thyroid cartilage um, named because of its proximity to the thyroid glands. And then here's that bump, the laryngeal prominence here. And then below that is that cricoid cartilage here it kind of looks like a signet ring with the um, top part of the ring where the jewel would be located anteriorly and then it goes around as a circle um, posteriorly kind of a, a lot thicker like a ring.
we have different ligaments that attach the different cartilages, which we'll get into. And then inferior to the larynx will be the beginning of the trachea, and we can see the different tracheal cartilages anteriorly. So here's a posterior view of the larynx. Again, here's the epiglottis. We can see part of the hyoid bone. And then posteriorly, we can see that thyroid cartilage here. And then we see the smaller paired cartilages that make up the larynx. Uh, here are the corniculate cartilages, the arytenoid cartilages. Um, and then uh, posteriorly, we can also see the posterior portion of the cricoid cartilage. The other paired cartilage that we uh, can see in this picture in the sagittal section that we couldn't see in the posterior section is that cuneiform cartilage here. So again, the three small pairs of uh, cartilage that make up the larynx, we have cuneiform, corniculate, and arytenoid here. Okay, so from a sagittal view, we can see the different folds. Uh, the more inferior fold that's also located more medially will be the true fold or the true vocal cord. And then laterally, and in this picture more superiorly, would be that vestibular fold that doesn't have anything to do with sound production. And here is that part of that cricoid cartilage. So in the front, this is where the jewel part of the signet ring would be, and then it gets bigger as it goes posteriorly. See how much bigger it looks posteriorly. So this is actually a superior view of the different folds. Um, we can see in the middle, again, we have the true vocal cords or vocal folds located more uh, medially, and the space um, between the vocal folds are is the rima glottidis, and then the rima plus the true vocal cords make up the glottis. And lateral to that would be the vestibular folds, and then we can also see part of the epiglottis here. Pretty cool. So we said that the larynx is important for voice production. Length of the vocal folds can change the pitch um, or can change with pitch. A loudness depends on the force of air across the vocal folds. Um, and then we also have a sphincter function of the larynx, as in Valsalva's maneuver. Uh, during abdominal straining, for example, while we're pooping or during defecation, uh, muscles contract and the glottis closes to pre prevent exhalation. During this time, this actually raises intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure. So this is known as the Valsalva. Valsalva maneuver, which is a series of events that helps to evacuate the rectum and help you poop. So this is um, closing that glottis, which is a sphincter function of the larynx to help you strain and to help you uh, defecate. The innervation of the larynx it is innervated by branches of the vagus nerve, also known as the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, going back to the length of the vocal folds, folds uh, change with pitch. When I was rotating in plastic and reconstructive surgery in Thailand, we were actually able to follow an ENT surgeon, and she was responsible for changing the pitch of patients that were undergoing uh, gender reassignment surgery. She showed us that you can actually uh, either lengthen or shorten these vocal folds to change pitch. So if you shortened the length, it would create a higher pitch so that you would have a more feminine or female sounding voice. If you lengthened these vocal folds, it will lower your pitch so that you sounded more masculine and sounded more male. And it was really cool. She did, she used very tiny sutures that looked really, you know, very tiny, but it was a really cool procedure. So the next structure that we're going to talk about within the respiratory system is the trachea.
The trachea descends into the mediastinum. It has C-shaped cartilage rings that keep the airway open. Again, these uh, cartilaginous rings made up of the hyaline cartilage that we saw in our slides in the beginning of the semester. The trachealis is located between the open ends of the C-shaped cartilage rings along the length of the posterior trachea. Note that within your anatomy worksheets for this unit, it actually asks you um, what is the what advantage is it that the rings are incomplete posteriorly? Um, if you read in your book, it has something to do with accommodating the esophagus during swallowing. So make sure you read that uh, in chapter 22. We talked about the carina. So the carina is that structure inferior to the trachea, where the trachea will then bifurcate and form the main primary bronchi. So you have a right, right primary bronchus and a left primary or main bronchus. So the crina marks where the trachea divides into two primary bronchi. The epithelium of the trachea, again, um, indicative of the respiratory system, uh, you have that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So here we see um, a section, a cross-section of the trachea and, and esophagus that we saw in our histo slides at the beginning of the semester. So anteriorly, we have the trachea, and then posterior to that is the esophagus. So the epithelium of the trachea being that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And then deep to the epithelium, we can see part of the cartilage making up those cartilaginous rings. Um, and again, this is made up of your hyaline cartilage here. So now we're going to talk about the bronchi in the conducting zone. Um, conducting zone, again, important for passageway of air or conducting air into the respiratory system. The bronchial tree is um, extensively branching respiratory passageways. It's first made up of the primary bronchi, also known as the main bronchi. The primary bronchi are the largest of the bronchi, and we start off with the right main bronchus or the right primary bronchus. So the right main bronchus is actually wider and shorter than the left. So we have the right main bronchus coming off of the crina, uh, which is that inferior structure of the trachea where it divides. So the right main bronchus will then divide um, to go to the different lobes of the right lung. There are three lobes of the right lung. There's a superior lobe, a middle lobe, and an inferior lobe. So the right main bronchus will divide into th three branches to go to the different lobes of the lung. Those are known as your secondary or lobar bronchi because these bronchi are going to the different lobes of the lung. On the left, we have the left main or primary bronchus. The left main primary bronchus will then divide into two because there are only two lobes to the left lung. There's a superior lobe and an inferior lobe. So from the left main or primary bronchus, it will then divide into a lobar or secondary bronchus. So the superior lobar or secondary bronchus and then the inferior uh, secondary um, or lobar bronchus. Okay. So for identification purposes, you just have to identify whether or not it, uh, the bronchi is primary, secondary, or tertiary. Other names for the bronchi. So primary, you can use main. Secondary, you can use lobar. Again, it's called lobar because it's going to the different lobes of the lung. And then you have segmental or tertiary bronchi. So segmental, within the lobes of the lung, it is divided into segments. Fortunately, you don't have to know all the segments. You just have to know that after 
lobar or secondary bronchi, it will then turn into segmental or tertiary bronchi, going to the different segments within the lobes of the lung. Again, there are three lobes to the right lung and two lobes to the left lung. So superior, middle, inferior lobes of the right lung and just superior and inferior lobes of the left lung. So here is just a histo slide showing the, um, the bronchus and its epithelium. Again, uh, the epithelium indicative of the respiratory system being that pseudostratified uh, ciliated columnar ep epithelium. Um, and then you can see some cartilage uh, within or just below the lamina propria. And then we do have some smooth muscle uh, that helps with movement within the bronchi. So again, in the conducting zone, you have the different bronchi. After the main or primary bronchi, you'll have secondary or lobar bronchi. There will be three on the right because there are three lobes to the right lung and then two secondary or lobar bronchi on the left because again, you only have two lobes in the left lung. The secondary or lobar bronchi will then branch into your tertiary or segmental bronchi, um, each branch going to a different lung segment within the lobes. The tertiary segmental bronchi will then turn into bronchioles. Uh, these are little bronchi less than one millimeter in diameter, and the bronchioles will then turn into terminal bronchioles. Terminal bronchioles are less than 0 0.5 millimeters in diameter. So we have changes in tissue composition within the bronchial tree. We do have su supportive connective tissue changes. Uh, C-shaped rings that we saw in the trachea will be replaced by cartilage plates. We see some epithelium changes. Initially, we know that the epithelium is a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium indicative of upper, upper respiratory system. This will then be replaced by simple columnar epithelium and then eventually simple cuboidal epithelium as uh, the uh, structures get smaller and smaller. Smooth muscle becomes important. Um, we know that under sympathetic stimulation, uh, smooth muscle helps to widen airways. So sympathetic stimulation being important in that fight or flight response. Uh, if we have a dinosaur chasing us or if we have someone not standing six feet away from us, we can use our, our um, sympathetic nervous system to help us run away. We want more air coming into our lungs so we have more... Um, oxygen going to our muscles to help us run away from someone trying to come within six feet of us. Um, and then under parasympathetic direction, uh, the smooth muscles help with constriction of these airways. This is our rest and digest um, functions. So from the conduction zone, we then head into the respiratory zone. The respiratory zone consists of air exchanging structures. So from the terminal bronchioles, uh, it will then turn into respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles being that first structure within the respiratory zone. Uh, within the respiratory bronchioles, gas exchange occurs where smooth muscle is absent. Uh, respiratory bronchioles are actually a branch from the terminal bronchioles. The respiratory bronchioles will lead to alveolar ducts and then lead to alveolar sacs. So here we see a terminal bronchial which will then turn into respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles being that first structure within the respiratory zone. So respiratory bronchioles will become alveolar ducts, which lead to alveolar sacs. Now, alveolar sacs are different from alveoli. Alveoli are actually individual uh, little sacs. If you think of alveolar sacs as grape structures, 
um, or clusters of grapes. So the alveolar sacs are, are the clusters of grapes, whereas alveoli are the individual grapes that make up the clusters. So alveoli are individual structures that make up alveolar sacs. And the alveolar duct is just that passageway that goes from the respiratory bronchioles down to the alveolar sacs. So histologically, we can see that respiratory uh, bronchial uh, coming or ending in the uh, alveolar sacs. Again, that cluster of alveoli. So alveoli, there are approximately 400 million alveoli, um, which account for a tremendous surface area for gas exchange. The surface area of Alveoli is about 1,500 square feet or about 140 square meters. Again, we need that surface area to allow for gas exchange. We have different cells that make up the alveoli. We have type 1 alveolar cells. These are single layers of simple squamous epithelial cells and surrounded by a basal lamina. Uh, alveolar cells... Um, are important because they make up the alveoli. Um, and then we have alveolar and capillary walls plus their basal lamina will form the respiratory, respiratory membrane. Type 2 alveolar cells. These types of cells are scattered among type 1 alveolar cells. These are cuboidal epithelial cells. They're important because they secrete surfactants. Surfactant is important because it helps reduce surface tension within the alveoli. Also within the alveoli, we have our alveolar macrophages. Macrophages, again, we think of those Pac-Man cells uh, that actually help engulf any inhaled particles uh, that might be pathogenic, um, that might be irritating. So they help remove the tiniest inhaled particle particles. Uh, they can then migrate into the bronchi and the ciliary action of the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium will take uh, these alveolar macrophages to the pharynx where these particles can be expelled. So here again we see terminal bronchioles ending um, the conducting zone and from the conducting, conducting zone starts the respiratory zone with the respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles will then become um, alveolar ducts, which will then end in clusters of alveoli called alveolar sacs. And we can see that uh, the systemic capillaries are actually very closely associated with these alveolar sacs so that we have exchange of gases uh, from the lungs into the blood or from the blood into the lungs depending on if it's oxygen or carbon dioxide. Oxygen will be uh, exchanged into the capillaries uh, to oxygenate any deoxygenated blood coming from the system and this re-oxygenated blood will then go back out uh, towards the pulmonary veins and from the pulmonary veins to the heart via the left atrium. And our uh, venules, part of the capillary system, will actually allow for the dumping of carbon dioxide into the alveolar sacs, and then will uptake the oxygen to be reoxygenated. So this is actually just a scanning electron micrograph of the pulmonary capillary um, surrounding the alveolar sacs. So here is the detailed anatomy of the respiratory membrane. We have those type 2 alveolar cells that uh, secrete surfactant to kind of um, release that uh, surface tension. And then we know that our capillaries are very closely associated with the uh, alveoli within the alveolar sacs so that we have exchange of gases across um, so our red blood cells, 
can uh, uptake oxygen, so oxygen diffuses across uh, the alveoli, and then carbon dioxide will go from the blood into the alveoli so that carbon dioxide can be exhaled. So some features of the alveoli, they're surrounded by elastic fibers, uh, interconnect by way of alveolar pores. The internal surfaces is a site for free movement of alveolar macrophages. Again, these cells important for um, taking up particles, ingesting particles, and then moving them up uh, back to the pharynx to be expelled either through the nose or through the mouth. So then we get into the gross anatomy of the lungs. We have major landmarks of the lungs that you guys need to take note of. The first landmark is the apex. This is the superior tip of the lung. And then we have the base of the lung. This is the concave inferior surface of the lung. Then we have this familiar word, the hilum. So we have the hilum of the lung. Again, this is a structure where vessels enter and exit the organ, in this case, the lungs. The hilum is an indentation on the mediastinal surface of the lung or the medial surface of the lung. This is where blood vessels, bronchi, and nerves enter and exit the lung. We have the root of the lung, uh, where structures that enter and leave the lung at the hilum, so the root actually contains the blood vessels, the bronchi, and the nerves. The left lung, again, is made up of two lobes. We have a superior and inferior lobe. There is a fissure uh, that separates the two lobes called the oblique fissure. And then we have a little notch called the cardiac notch. It is a depression that will accommodate the heart on the left. The right lung is made up of three lobes. We have the superior, middle, and inferior lobes. And we have different fissures that separate these lobes. We have the oblique fissure and the horizontal fissure. So here we can see an anterior view of the lungs. On the left, we have our superior, inferior lobe. And then we have this um, fissure separating the two lobes called the oblique fissure. And then we have this little notch right here located anteriorly. This is the cardiac notch. On the right, we know the lung is made up of three lobes. We have the superior lobe, the middle lobe, and the uh, inferior lobe. And we have the different fissures that separate the three lobes. So we have the horizontal fissure here separating the superior lobe and the middle lobe on the right. And then we have this oblique fissure, this line uh, that separates the middle lobe from the inferior lobe. So these concave surfaces at the bottom, these make up the base of uh, each lung. And then each lung has a pointy uh, superior portion called the apex. So here's the apex of the left lung, and here's the apex of the right lung. So medial view of the left lung, um, here, this whole structure right here would be considered uh, the hilum, where vessels enter and exit uh, the left lung. So here is that pointy uh, part of the left lung called the apex, and then we have a concave uh, surface. This is the base. Uh, we can see that there is uh, an impression for the heart uh, on the medial portion. And then posterior to the hilum, we can see a groove or impression for, for the aorta. So this is where the aorta would be located. And then uh, if you ever get to see a gross specimen, of the lung, you can actually um, identify the pulmonary artery, which is located a little bit more uh, superiorly and anteriorly, and then uh, these structures here that make up the pulmonary veins. So we talked about uh, the different segments. Um, we know that the bronchi, the main bronchi, will then turn into lobar or secondary bronchi, and the lobar uh, 
bronchi will then turn into tertiary or segmental bronchi. They're called segments because they go to the different segments within the lobes of the lung. Uh, in medical school, I had to learn all the different segments and actually dissecting them out. And it's actually kind of fun if you ever get into it. You can definitely, you know, trace the segments and see where they go uh, within the lung, and you can identify them based on where these segment, segments go. For example, the apical segment goes towards the apex um, of the lung, um, Specifically in the right, there's only one apical segment, whereas in the left, there will be an apical posterior segment because it goes to the apex and the posterior portion of the left lung. So if you ever have time and get to dissect out an actual lung, it's actually kind of fun to kind of look for and discover the different uh, segmental or tertiary branches of the bronchi. So blood supply and innervation of the lungs, again, we have the pulmonary arteries. These are the only arteries in the body that have deoxygenated blood. So the pulmonary arteries are delivering oxygen-poor blood to the lungs um, coming from the uh, pulmonary trunk, which comes from the right ventricle. The pulmonary veins are the only veins in the body that carry oxygenated blood. They will carry this oxygenated blood to the heart, uh, to specifically towards the left atrium. Innervation of the lungs includes sympathetic, parasympathetic, and visceral sensory fibers. So parasympathetic fibers will constrict airways, whereas sympathetic uh, fibers will dilate airways. Again, we want the sympathetic response is that fight or flight response. We want more air to be oxygenated so we can deliver more oxygen to our uh, body so that we can run away in, uh, in case someone tries to get within six feet of us and does not adhere to social dis distancing. So here is just a view, a transverse section through the thorax at the vertebral level of T6, viewed superiorly or from above. So we can actually see um, if this is anterior and this is posterior. So that means this would be the left lung, this is the right lung. And then we can see uh, the, uh, this would be considered the hilum of the lung if we kind of circle that area because this is where vessels will enter and exit the lung. Um, we can see where the main bronchi are coming uh, or traveling towards the different lungs. So we have the left main bronchus and the right main bronchus. Um, and then we can see the uh, pulmonary artery as well as the pulmonary veins. Um, and then we can see the uh, pericardium that surrounds the heart and the pleura that will surround uh, the lungs. Speaking of the pleura, so the pleura is a double layered sac that surrounds each lung. Again, think of that balloon. Um, we take our fist, we punch the balloon, and we have a layer of that balloon that adheres to our fist. Um, that would be the visceral layer or the visceral pleura. Viscera again meaning organ. We then have the layer of that balloon that adheres to the thoracic wall and that would be the parietal pleura um, or the parietal layer. And then there's a space between the pleura. This is the pleural cavity. This is the potential space between the visceral and parietal pleura. And the pleura is important because it helps divide the thoracic cavity um, into the central mediastinum and then the two lateral pleural comp compartments um, where the lungs are located. So again, just another picture of uh, the lungs. Here we can actually see the pleura. Uh, we can see the visceral pleura is that layer that adheres to the lungs. We see the pleural cavity, which is that space, and then the uh, parietal pleura, which adheres to the thoracic wall. And just another picture of the bronchopulmonary segments. Um, so again, 
we go from our main bronchi, so we have a right main bronchus, left main bronchus. Here is the carina, where the trachea divides. Uh, then we have our lobar bronchi, so we have a superior here, and then we'll have a middle and an inferior uh, lobar segment. You don't have to name them, you just have to be able to identify them. Um, and then you have the segmental or tertiary branches going to the different segments within the lobes of the lungs. So when we talk about segments, each lobe can actually be divided into different segments. Um, so we have an apical, an anterior and posterior segment of the superior lobe of the right lung, whereas uh, with the left lung, we have many different segments in the superior lobe. So um, just know that each lobe of the um, either right or left lung, they're divided into different segments. And here we can see position of the lungs and pleural cavities in reference to the thoracic cage. This is more important if you're thinking about doing any thoracocentesis, meaning um, introducing a needle uh, to the pleura, which is something I did once, uh, specifically in a patient with TB pneumonia. You kind of want to have an idea where the inferior border of the lung is so that you don't puncture the lung with your needle. But this is just a good picture showing you where the lungs are in reference to the different ribs uh, within the thoracic cage um, so that you can use those as a landmark. So this is the end of part one of the respiratory system and I will have a part two in just a little bit.